a uh, small group, obviously, so we'll make it a little more personal. Um, I'm Matt Tamori, I'm with Innovatus Imaging. Uh, been in the ultrasound industry for 30, it'll be 34 years uh, this October. I started with Accuson, actually, it's much bigger. No, it'll be 33 years this October. I started with Accuson on October, October 20th, 1986. Um, and I've been in the ultrasound industry ever since. So, and I've done pretty much everything within the ultrasound industry. I've done service, I did service for about a quarter century uh, training. Um, I used to teach people how to fix all the different ultrasound machines. I used to write the training manuals. Uh, I have a clinical background, so I can scan. Um, I, uh, I, I scan people as a hobby. My wife is actually a registered sonographer, so we're an ultrasound family. And so ultrasound is in my blood, love the modality. And one of the things that um, we, uh, we were looking at is accreditation. Um, I go around, um, Ted, uh, Ted Mussini, he's our clinical expert. He's in the back corner there, another delinquent in the back row. Um, Ted, is, uh, Ted and I, we go around to hospitals around the country and we do something called a process analysis, where we go in and we look at the usage cycle of a probe. So if you look at like a transesophageal probe, TE probe, we go in and we look at every phase of that transducer's usage. So how is it used? How is it transported? How is it stored? How is it disinfected? And so on. And then we make recommendations on how to mitigate probe damage. So we look at chemical usage, <clears throat> excuse me, and all those things. And one of the things I ask when we go in and do these process analysis is I ask people, are you accredited and by which bodies? And most people don't know in the clinical engineering departments. They say, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're accredited or not. Well, if you're in clinical engineering, biomed, in a hospital, you need to know which departments are accredited and by whom because they have specific standards. And you, as the maintenance provider, you need to perform some of these things, or you need to ensure that your service provider, if you're using an OEM or a third party, if you're not doing it yourself, you need to ensure that they're going to, through some of these things to maintain your accreditation, because part of accreditation is up to whoever the service provider, who's ever maintaining the equipment. And so um, Ted and I um, came together and we wrote this, uh, we developed this material, and it talks about the major accreditation bodies that oversee the ultrasound modality and what their standards are. So since we only have five people, um, if I could ask you to introduce yourselves, tell me who you're with, what you do there. Why don't we start over here? Okay. Okay, Hopkins and Hopkins. Oh, we met Dan. Actually, you had a really bad cold. I remember that. You and Deb. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not just general violence. It's a cool job. From up. And you guys work with Rob Bundy. Okay, cool. So let's get started. Oh, we're off to a good start. We got that dead clicker here, Ted. The laser works. We got the cool laser, but not so not working. Yeah, no, we got a dead clicker. Usually this thing works. Okay, now you're working. Okay, we're back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No worries. <laughs> yeah, but screw it, the people next door. Awesome. <laughs> so what we're going to go over today, and you know, as we go through this, please feel free to ask questions. You know, I, I, I like these things to be interactive rather than I mean, just yapping about material that can be a little dry. Um, so we're going to talk about the testing criteria for each individual board. 
Um, how to perform the tests. We're going to talk about assessing transducer performance in the field. There's all different kinds of ways to test probes in the field. There's test equipment out there that does it. Um, there's different criteria. We'll talk about testing transducers. Um, we'll, what we're going to do today is we're going to demystify field testing of transducers because there's a lot of noise around that. Uh, so we'll, we'll cut through all the noise and we'll, we'll talk about what you really need to do in the field. Um, quality control data. And, and then at the end, um, Ted over here, um, Ted developed these tips on how these care and handling tips for probes. And I can send this presentation to you folks um, that will save you money if you follow these things. You know, we, we're in the probe repair business. We restore probes. Uh, we manufacture probes for several OEMs. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we're FDA registered for uh, probe manufacturing, 1345 2016 for probe repair. Um, and so we, we know probes um, like nobody else. And so one of the things that we do is we work with healthcare providers to try and mitigate probe damage. Uh, you're never going to eliminate it. And thankfully, you don't because that's what we do uh, is we fix probes. Uh, but very rarely do probes die of natural causes. Usually, what happens with probes is prevent And we have some really cool tips at the end of this that talks about how to prevent some probe damage. So what is accreditation? It's, it's, a, peer, it's a peer review process. There's, there's a lot that goes into accreditation. Um, the, there's, there's three legs. So it's not required. But with accreditation, if you go on, for example, the uh, ACR website, uh, the ACR website will tell you all the different organizations that are ACR accredited. Um, I would probably not utilize um, an imaging center or something like that that was not ACR accredited. Um, ACR accreditation is similar to like our 1345. Um, it, it shows that you have a dedication to a continuous quality program. And so, uh, most most organizations are today. Um, we're going to talk about three different bodies: uh, ACR, AI, AIUM, and IAC. Uh, ACR is American College of Radiology. AIUM is the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, and IAC is the Intersocial Intersocial Accreditation Commission. Um, it used to be two different boards. It used to be ICAL, ICAEL, it was the Intersocial Commission, Echocardiography Labs, and Vascular Labs. So ICAL and ICAEL. They, those two came together into just one organization called the IAC. So uh, they're, they're now one body and it's easier to pronounce. So what, what do you need to do for accreditation? Well, your job is actually fairly simple. The other portions of the accreditation is the sonographer, he or she has to um, save um, a series of images associated with a patient and submit those. And then the doctor who reviews um, that exam has to submit their diagnoses or their, their interpretation of those images. And what the board does is they look at the ultrasound images, they look at the doctor's interpretation of those images, and they say, okay, they, this is a good scan, these are beautiful images, the doctor interpreted these correctly. So that's that's the, the portion that we are, you know, we in this room are not responsible for. Um, what we are responsible for is the quality control on the equipment itself. So let's talk a little bit about transducers. Um, a lot of this revolves around the transducer itself. Um, how many are you? Would, how many of you would say you're, you're deeply? You have a deep understanding of transducers and you know, how they're made and what they do and so on. Excellent. So, like I said, I've been in this business for a very long time, and what we're what we're seeing today is there are some. Actually, a lot of people that have viewed transducer as a commodity, as something that's binary, it's either on or off, it works or it doesn't. Uh, but transducers are very sophisticated medical devices. They're, they're an instrument, they're, they're a class two medical device, and there's a lot that goes into the probe. And so we touch on probe construction just a little bit. So if you look at the, the lens of the transducer, uh, the lens is not just a barrier between the patient and the array. Um, the lens is called a lens for a reason. Uh, I see that. Four out of five are wearing glasses. Or no, actually, you're not wearing glasses. I got to put my glasses on because he was wearing glasses. So just, just like an optical lens um, for our eyeglasses, the lens of a transducer 
is a lens. It is, it's, its job, um, it has multiple jobs, but one of its main jobs is to perform mechanical focusing of the ultrasound beam. If you do not put a lens on a transducer properly, um, if you don't shape it properly, you're not going to get good focus of your ultrasound beam. It's going it's to adversely affect your image quality. <coughs> Excuse me, no, hold um, The lens also must be um, ISO compliant, uh, ISO 10993. Uh, what that uh, speaks to is biocompatibility. So anything that touches a patient, it has to be um, ISO 10993 compliant. Um, the lens is uh, single or multiple layers. Um, the lens thickness, uh, we, we do lens probes, we, we probably do lens probes, um, and each one has its own unique mold. Um, and we measure down the micro. If you put on a lens with a probe too thick, you're going to lose sensitivity. If you put it on too thin, you're going to increase the mechanical index of the amount of power you're putting out of that probe, which you don't need to do the well. And so the lens of the probe is, is very critical, and there's a lot of science that goes into it. Um, below that is something called matching layers. Um, I actually listened to about a one hour lecture on what matching layers do. Um, it's at the at the end of the day, what they do is they they match the impedance of the probe with the impedance of the human body for more effective transmission. Of the that's that's kind of the reason why just of a of a matching layer. You can see that generally they're a quarter wavelength of the center frequency of the transducer. So these matching layers, they're virtually transparent, um, and they they're made out of various materials depending on the OEM. Uh, but it's it's kind of cool the way they work. And on a lot of probes, there's multiple matching layers. To get the probe impedance to match the, the body for energy. Um, then we have the array. Um, are, are you folks going to visit the exhibit hall today? Walk through. Um, stop by our booth, room number two hundred three. Um, we actually have, um, um, besides uh, restoring probes and manufacturing probes, we also manufacture transducer arrays um, in our, our FDA registered facility. We have uh, an array in our booth. Um, that I had the technician stop the dicing saw about halfway through the manufacturing process. And we have it in our booth and we have it under a, a microscope that's we're, we're magnifying 250, uh, 250 times. And so you can actually see what an array looks like, a, a raw array, and you can see what it looks like magnified. It's really cool. So if you get them, if you get them on the stop by 203, we'll, we'll show it to you. So what you see up here is this, this array, this is a human hair overlay on top of a transducer array. Um, a typical transducer element is about the width of a human hair. Um, the spacing in between the elements, with, where, we, uh, where we dice the elements with this dicing saw, um, is about one-fifth the width of the human hair. And so we have all these different saw blades depending on the arrays that we're manufacturing. And I, I, what are they made out of? Are they stainless? I, I know they're diamond, they have, they, they have uh, a diamond component to it, but I think they're stainless. But, so, since we're dicing the array to one fifth the width of the human hair, um, these blades obviously are extraordinarily skinny. And so when, they, when you hold them, it's almost like aluminum foil. Um, they're, they're very floppy. Um, and so we have to spin them up to, I think it's about 40,000 RPMs. And once you get them up, you spun up that fast, they straighten out, and that's when you, you run the, the, the array through the saw. So it's really cool to watch. So below the array, we have something called shielding. Um, it reduces the EMI and RFI. And then we have a backing material. Backing material, all, all it is is really, it's a backboard. So when we fire the, the, uh, the transducer, you want to direct the energy away from the transducer. And so we use something called a backing material. Um, below that, we have a flex circuit. Um, this is the flex circuit here. We have some really cool ones. Um, my, my favorite one is, it's for the GE Endovaginal Pro. It's uh, the GE ic 5 9 b um, it looks like a it looks like a flower. Uh, when you when you open up the flex circuit, it's got all these these different circuits that kind of unfold, and it literally looks like a flower when it unfolds. Um, and we manufacture those. It's kind of neat. And then we have an interconnect, which is just a bridge between the transducer and the main cable, and then we have miniature coaxes. Um, how many of you have seen the inside of a transducer cable made harness? Have you seen that? Uh, those all those miniature coaxes. Uh, the uh, we, we manufacture those cables. Um, we, uh, we we have an engineering center in uh, Denver, and what we do is when we develop a cable for a transducer. We we buy three brand new OEM cables. They go off to Denver. Denver does all their B and B on them. Uh, we we measure capacitance, we measure inductance, we measure 
assistance, we measure, I don't know, um, Michael Bree, our CTO, he described me all the things that he, he, he does, and he used a lot of big words that I didn't understand. Um, but we, we do all those things to back into the design of the cable, and then we manufacture them, and then they go down to Tulsa where we do our repairs. And in Tulsa, we have people that they put these new cables on transistors every day, all day. And they're soldering these miniature coaxes that are about the width of a human hair. And so it's a coax cable. So you have a conductor and then you have a shield on each one. And they're hand soft, they're all hand soft. And these people, and it takes about these 10 hours to, to put a cable on a transistor. And so we have about 100 different people. You have one end, yeah, there's two ends. Um, and there's, there's typically there's 128 of those within the main cable. So if you think about your you know, your cable television or your satellite television, you have that you know that quarter inch, you know, maybe three eighths of an inch diameter coax coming into your house. Imagine 128 of those inside something that is probably not much thicker than this HDMI cable. And so we make we, we currently make about 65 different cables because each OEM, even within an OEM, they they make little tweaks to their cable. So if the OEM made it a certain way, we have to make it a certain way to match the, the OEM characteristics. And we have a strain relief, um, which is a very common breakpoint, uh, cable jacket, and then we have, of course, the main cable that we just talked about. When we do image testing, um, Ted, um, I consider Ted an expert in um, Ted is extraordinarily good at what he does. Um, I consider myself an expert. If you put Ted and I in front of the same ultrasound machine and we didn't share knowledge, our interpretation of the results of that machine would be different. Um, it's, it's virtually impossible to do an objective test, um, which is why standardization is critical. Um, if I get in front of an ultrasound machine today, say I have a machine over here and I'm doing my QA and I say, okay, I bring up an abdomen protocol and I get up my phantom and I do all my tests, and then Ted comes in six months later and says, okay, you know, you know, Matt hit the lottery, he retired, he's old. Um, I got to I gotta take over, I got to do QA. And so Ted goes over to that machine and he brings up a cardiac protocol and starts scanning a phantom. The results are going to be dramatically different. And so you have to be consistent um, every time you get in front of the machine. What, what I recommend is you create your own QA protocol. So if you're familiar enough with the ultrasound machines, it is you put a preset in that machine um, that is, you can call it ACR, you can call it QA, you can call it, you can call it fill. It doesn't matter, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, but that is that is your standard that you put in. And as long as you stick with that standard, there is no standard. I mean, the ACR and AIUM, they have certain standards, they tell you to do certain things, um, but they don't tell you how to do everything. And so it's up to you to create your own standard when you do these, these quality control checks. So you need these um, identical settings. Um, number of focal points. Um, so if you look at the side of an image, they have those little carrots, um, or there will be little symbols on the side, and it tells you how many times the machine is electronically focusing. You want those focal points at a, at a minimum. And then disable software corrections. Um, there's so much software going on in ultrasound machines today. Ultrasound machines, when I started, it was 5% software, 95% hardware. Today, it's the opposite. Um, all all ultrasound machines are today, are, it's a big honking computer with a couple of ultrasound boards on it, and that's it. When, when I started the field Accuracy 128, it had 80 circuit boards. Um, I love that machine. In fact, I got a buddy who's got one, and um, he was going to scrap it. I said, no, I'll send it to my garage because um, it's that good. Uh, but it, it has 80 circuit boards in it. I don't know how many miles of wire, seven power supplies, and there's just a beat in the end. A beautiful machine. Uh, the design was amazing. Um, on, that, on, on that particular machine, it was all hardware. Today, it's software. And so these software corrections, the, the machines today, they do all kinds of corrections to smooth out the image and enhance the image. Um, so you want to turn these corrections off. And we use an example, uh, Phillips that calls it x rays from CT, and THI, which is tissue harmonic imaging. Um, GE calls it cross -beam. Here's the thing about the manufacturers. They have all the really cool names. Like, so if we look at cross -beam, X-Res and C-Clear. They're all the same thing. The, the systems are doing the same thing. They just call them different things to them as they like to trade But it's, I, I like to draw analogies to cars when we talk about ultrasound. It's got an engine, it's got a transmission, it's got a radio, it does all, yeah, it's got a platform. Um, it's got all these things that every other car has. 
You want to save that stuff. So let's get into the ACR. How many of you in this room are, um, have departments that are ACR present? Are you guys doing quality control checks now? You are. You hire a third party? Who are you using? In Wisconsin. Well, you do have physicists. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Um, uh, not many people use a physicist. I think that's cool. Um, I know ultrasound physicists. Um, they're, they're fascinating people. Um, <laughs> they're a hell of a lot smarter than I am. Um, most, most, um, what, what ACR dictates is they, they ask you to use a physicist for these checks or a designee. Um, and, and the designee is you're out to do it yourself or have a, a, a service organization. So the ultrasound accreditation program is, as I mentioned earlier, um, the acquisition of clinical images, the physician reports, and then the quality control documentation. Um, we threw this image in here. This is actually um, this is my liver um, before last night. This is my kidney here. Um, I have um, what, what people in the industry call a glass body. I'm a very easy scan. In fact, it was late 80s or early 90s. Um, I just actually used my liver and kidney. And so it, it looked like actually almost exactly like that. I have a, I have a beautiful little kidney. So as part of the um, quality control program, it needs to be completed at least once every 14 months. Um, ACR is actually loosened up a little bit. They used to be, they used to mandate twice. And now they, they use vague terms like, you should. You should do something. Well, what, and what does should mean? Um, should, it, should is not a mandate, it's a suggestion. Um, and so when I get suggestions, um, I'm of the belief that less is more. Um, and so if you don't have to do a bunch of different things, why make it more complicated? And so we'll talk about the things that you have to do, and we'll also talk about the things that ACR says is optional. Um, they're also, you know, they're, they're kind of nebulous in here. They, they tell you that the use of a phantom is not, um, is not necessary. But then they tell you to measure depth of penetration, which, I mean, you can do it on your body. Not many people are that comfortable with a probe to do that consistently. Um, having a phantom is, is something that moves you into the objective realm. Um, I, I, I scan my body on a regular basis, but most people don't. And so they, they say you know, the phantom's not required. And then in the next statement, they say you got to measure depth of penetration. How do you do that? Take that. <clears throat> So um, the, annual, uh, the annual survey, which we'll talk about, um, is performed by a medical physicist or a designee. We are the designees. Um, documentation of corrective action, this is huge. So when you go through this, when you go through this accreditation or this check, this survey, and you, you mark down that that system is deficient in any way, you have failed that accreditation. You, you have made yourself non-compliant at that point. Which is fine. I mean, again, that's what, that's why we do this. We want to do this because if there's something that's deficient, we have to identify it. Um, so it's I, I used to flunk systems all the time. But what you have to do once you fail a system, you check that box. This the system is out of compliance. You have to record and demonstrate the corrective action. So if you're scanning with a transducer and this transducer has multiple elements out. Um, you would say, hey, there's dropouts. You check the box. Um, I, I got dropouts on this probe. You are now out of compliance. Well, what's the corrective action? I have paperwork that shows that I sent the probe off to antibiotics. They did the probe repair, and I got it back. And you put that documentation with that, and now you've brought the system back in. And so it's totally cool to fail a system. That's what we're here for. We do. Um, but you have to show the fix. Um, ACR states um, that. Um, uniformity, geometric accuracy, system sensitivity, and contrast spatialization must be made using an ultrasound fan or test out. They say that here, but they, they say elsewhere in the documentation that you don't have to have a fan. So you obviously, you, measuring these things, if you're checking 
um, uniformity, geometric accuracy, so you're measuring the pins, you have to okay, um, unless you know your body is stored well. So we do a physical and mechanical inspection. Um, what's kind of funny about the, the physical inspection is they still ask, um, is the camera and other accessories still fastened, uh, fastened properly to the machine? Well, they don't have cameras on machines anymore. Um, that, that went out in the, probably the 90s. Um, the, those old Accusons that I used to work on, they had this matrix camera. It was about this big, it weighed about 80 pounds, and you had to lift this thing off the top of the machine before you disassembled it. Um, and so everywhere that machine went, it had a camera that, that shot eight by 10 film on top of the machine. Well, nowadays, you know, with packs and hard drives and all these things, this was before hard drives were on the machines, I think it was before hard drives were back then. And so they still ask, is the camera fastened to the machine? So you, you can say anything, uh, unless you still have a camera. If you have a camera on your mind. And so we have to do uniformity and artifact inspection, system sensitivity, and system display settings. Um, that's important as well, system display settings. Uh, when I started, uh, systems had a CRT that was not but even with the uh, LEDs and LCDs on today's systems, you still have to check the settings. Um, is the um, the system sensitivity, how far can you penetrate with a particular probe? And that's, that's where we go back to being consistent with your setups on the machine. When I started, you know, back when these things were running on coal, um, the systems had, or the transistors had one single frequency. Um, a three and a half megahertz probe is a three and a half megahertz probe. It is what it is. Um, today, transducers, these broadband transducers have all these wonderful frequencies. I mean, they, you know, some of the abdominal probes can range from like two to seven, eight megahertz, and then they have harmonics, you throw harmonics into that, so you, you have like six or seven different settings for a particular probe. If you're not consistent and you're not using the same settings each time, you're going to get dramatically different sensitivity results when you measure it. Um, the option testing is geometric accuracy. It's when you measure the pins within a, a phantom. Um, contrast resolution, um, we have a, a pictogram of a, a tissue mimicking phantom, um, but there's six different cysts uh, inside that phantom of various densities. And the, the contrast resolution is how sensitive is that machine? How, how well can that machine differentiate between these masses of different densities? Um, spatial resolution. And then um, the primary interpretation of display performance, uh, or PAX workstation. This is another kind of gotcha. If the physician, if he or she is on site reading, ACR asks you to inspect their monitor. Um, so, I'm going to peek your head in. And, um, the radiologist reading room, um, I would highly recommend not touching that monitor um, unless you want to get shot or fired. <laughs> radiologists are going to touch you while you mess with your stuff. Um, but you know, unless you see something dramatically deficient in the monitor, you know, a bunch of pixels out or something like that, you know, it's, it's more of a pencil whip. Yeah, I looked at it, it looks fine. Um, radiologists are happy on that. Um, if you're doing offsite reading, obviously you can't do that. So, uniformity and artifact inspection. Um, I took this image. Um, this is a, uh, an Acrosan sequoia. You can see there's an element out here. Um, there's there's um, a couple of different artifacts that we get in the bunch. All kinds of different artifacts we get in the image. But what we're talking about here with the imaging for me, um, you have hyperechoic and hypoechoic. Hyperechoic is you have a bright area, uh, which could indicate a hot element or um, the, trans the transmitter portion of the machine is far too hot or um, hypoechoic, which is a dropout. Uh, what we have here, right here, is a dropout. So if we have a dropout, what costs it? Well, I mean, the first thing we want to look at is you know, the probe. Um, what, one of the things I do when I field test probes is I'll just I'll hold the probe by the cable. If this is the transducer cable and this is the head, I'll just kind of slowly rotate the scan head around the cable, uh, flexing at the strain relief. That's usually where cables break. And it, as you're doing that, you watch the image, and if you see the little, if you see any variations in the near field, you know you have some broken cables. So that's one of the most common things that we have to do is when we repair probes, um, I say half the probes that come into our facility, we have to recable um, because the cable starts breaking the scan. So you want to check the cable. Um, if you have another probe of the same type, pop it on the machine, does it do the same thing? Um, 
if it's not the cable, if it's not the, the, uh, the, uh, the array, then you want to look at, well, do I have a machine problem? Uh, then you start following the transducer down into the machine. Um, the first thing you want to look at is the connector board. Are all the pins on the connector board intact or are any of the bands are broken? Uh, and then you go inside the machine. Um, how many actually, how many of you folks in here are actually physically working on machines? Well, and the thing about, you know, when, when I was doing service, I, I've done tens of thousands of PMs in my life. I, I can't say I like one to turn a vacuum cleaner off and on, you know, PMs on all for some. And one of the things I did when I was in the service business is every time I walked into the room, um, and also, no matter what reason I was there for, um, I looked at the probes. Um, I looked at the connected board on the machine, and I looked at the pins on the probes. What happens with probes, uh, pin probes, is you bend a pin on a probe. Okay, now you have a problem, right? Um, it's, not a, it's not a bad problem. I mean, we fix bent pins and broken pins. We replace pins every day all day. But what happens is you have a bent pin, and then the sonographer plugs that into the machine. Now that bent pin bends the a pin on the connector board, on the interface. So now you have two problems. So now you, 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 your probe is damaged, now you've damaged your machine. But then it gets worse. And so then the sonographer unplugs that probe and plugs another probe into that port. So the bent pin on the port damages this probe. And then the probe goes across the hall and it damages the port on the machine. Across, and it, it's, like, it's like a virus. And so I highly recommend you, you constantly inspect your connector boards. Um, connector boards are relatively inexpensive, um, but checking them on a regular basis um, and, and checking the pins on your probes uh, will save you a fortune. Um, so I recommend checking them every day all day. So here, here's our pictogram of a fan. So geometric accuracy, this is optional. So again, if something's optional, you're, you're welcome to do it. I don't. Um, I've never seen a machine. I mean, these these machines are you know today's machines are. are well. um, I've never machine. I've never seen a machine that's been out of compliance as far as you know. They're all out here. But what we're doing is we're checking um, the resolution of the machine. Um, if you look at this this diagram over here, all kinds of different resolutions on an ultrasound machine. We, we, we talk about resolution. Resolution is a generic term. Um, we have actual resolution, which is our, our vertical or our Texas. Um, we have lateral resolution, which is our y-axis, and then we have elevational resolution, uh, which is our basically our side to side, our z-axis. <clears throat> and then we have something called temporal resolution. Temporal resolution is um, how well the machine can pick up motion over time. So temporal is time. Um, system sensitivity. This is something you have to do. So it measures the maximum depth of visualization of speckle patterns or phantom targets. If we use phantom targets like this, this particular image here, um, again, Ted, Ted's an expert, I'm an expert. If you put us in front of the machine, even with the same settings, same probe, same settings, same phantom, same everything, Ted's results are going to be a little bit different than mine. But I can virtually guarantee it. Because what we're looking at is we have all these these uh, phantom targets here. You can see our speckle pattern is starting to fade away somewhere in this area here. I can see this pin, but you can see the texture, this tissue mimic and phantom, the texture of the phantom starts to fade away somewhere in this area here. So, how deep is that particular system scan? Where, where do you believe the image is dropping off? If you go to the targets, even with a, a high, high frequency probe and a deep phantom, you can see a target well below the noise level because they're very bright and very dense. So they'll reflect sound, um, but they're, they're well below what we call the noise floor. And so I don't believe, even though you can see that target, I don't believe the system is penetrating to that point. Um, it, it's not penetrating sufficiently to be diagnosed. And so I always look and see where the speckle pattern um, has. The ACR says speckle pattern or phantom targets. I don't use phantom targets. Um, because if, if I took this particular probe and I raise the frequency, you know, if I double the frequency, my speckle pattern would raise up probably three or four centimeters. I'd still see that last pin, but it's not that easy. And so I, I go with speckle patterns. So system display settings. 
what I did here is I set um, the uh, display on the ultrasound machine um, improperly and properly. This first image, obviously, way too bright. Um, the lights are just blooming. The background here, this, you see the background run image, it's really gray, kind of washed out. This image here is perfect. Um, and what you use is every system out there that I've ever seen um, has a grayscale bar. You see these grayscale bars. They're either discrete, um, 16 different steps, or they're gradual. But regardless of whether they're discrete or gradual, I always look at the very last box or the, the end of the grayscale bar because it's the blackest. And then I set the monitor so the background of the monitor is barely blacker than that last step. So the, that last step is almost fading into that black background. That's when you know your background is set up. Um, this one is obviously very, very important stuff. Um, and ensure proper focus, ACR addresses focus. On the old Accusan machine, there was actually a focus block on CRTs. We don't, we don't have that. We have LEDs. So what you want to do is if you are adjusting the display on an ultrasound machine, the first thing you want to do is set the ambient light in the room to what the sonographer is going to be using. Um, if you walk into a room and we're doing service, and of course, sonographers work in the dark. Uh, my, my wife is actually part of this uh, sonographer group. It's a little risque. They, it's called sonographers do it in the dark. Uh, but they, they live in the dark. And so if you go in and you're doing service, first thing we're going to do is we're going to walk in the room and flip on the lights so we can see what the heck we're doing. If you try and adjust the monitor at that point, you're going to, you're going to gap it up. Um, you have to have the room at the lighting, at the lighting level that the sonographer uses. And then use that grayscale bar. You set the background where that last step is just barely fading in. And then you adjust the whites. And this is, you know, none of us carry around a densitometer. And so you, 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 um, you also, you want to ask the sonographer, you want the sonographer to be a part of this. Some sonographers, they like misadjusted monitors, um, especially uh, cardiac people. They like their backgrounds uh, a little gray. They're, they're, they're not a bunch. Um, and so I would not adjust the sonographer's monitor without his or her permission. I have a trick question. So I have two, two images here, and both these images are improperly set. That first one, the background is way too light. <clears throat> the whites are blooming. It's a horrible image. Um, this one, the monitor, the, the the density is way too high, and so you can, you can barely see the image. So if I have an improperly set monitor, either this one or this one, will it affect what the images look like on the axis? Okay, yes. Remember, this is a trick question. Okay, yes, no. Dan says no, no. Why, why yes? Pardon me? It's not, it's not, it's not as clear, but will the, will the PAC system, will it show up differently on the PAC system? How okay. come? Kind of. What's, what's going to happen is this particular image here, this image is horrible. And so I have the monitor set. It, it's, it's set it properly. The image is awful. And so what the sonographer is going to do is he or she, when they get in front of that machine, they're going to go, I can't find my image. I can't pull this thing out. So they're going to start cranking up the gain on the machine. And they're going to try and do everything they can to make that image brighter to make it more diagnostic. Well, in doing that, what's going to happen is the image over on PAX is going to be the opposite of that. So the image over on PAX is going to look like that. So if your monitor is set like that, your image on PAX is going to look like that. So if your monitor is like that, they're going to be like, oh my God, this image is so bright. And they're going to start cranking down the image. They're going to try and de-emphasize the image. And so it'll look like that over on PAX. And so it has the opposite effect. So there's not a direct cause and effect, but the sonographer, to compensate for a poorly set monitor, will do the opposite. And so it will affect what you see on the panels. So they want you to check the uh, um, primary interpretation display performance. So this is the radiologist monitor. 
So it's the same test as the display of the system, uh, but you see I have proceed with caution. Never ever mess around with the radiologist unless they, they are there and they give you permission. Uh, they're, they're very touchy. So contrast resolution, you see this? We have our tissue mimic and phantom now. And these are our grayscale particles. And you see it says plus 15 dB, plus 6, plus 3, minus 3, minus 6, minus 15. These, the, the, the decibels um, speak to the density of these targets. And so the contrast resolution of the machine is how well can the machine differentiate between these different density amounts. So if you look at, um, uh, sometimes when people get um, uh, liver, um, liver mass metastases, um, they're, they're not that much different in density than surrounding liver tissue. And so you want a good machine with good contrast resolution to be able to see those things. And we, we talked about um, uh, resolution, lateral, axial, elevational, and temporal. Um, this is optional. Um, if you want, you can measure these pins. Um, but when we talk about spatial resolution, <clears throat> spatial resolution is lateral, axial, and elevational all in one. Most fandoms, unless you have a really cool fandom, and I don't, you probably don't, um, do not have the ability for you to test elevation or slice thickness resolution. Uh, we have those in our um, repair and engineering centers, but they're very expensive. Um, so you probably don't have that anyways. But you can do axial lab, so you measure the, 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 the axial lab. Um, the, ACR says this is also optional, evaluation of the quality control program. Do you have a quality control program for your ultrasound machines? Um, they, they ask you, okay, this is optional, um, to evaluate that program. Is that program doing everything it's supposed to do? And this is the, um, the evaluation summary form. Um, this is on the ACR website. If you just go to acr.org, you can download these, these forms. But here, um, it says mark the appropriate box. So here is where you measure system sensitivity. And these are, it's very hard to read, but, and I can send you folks this presentation. Um, but they ask you, how deep does particular transducer pick? And so you want to pick a consistent transducer. So if, you, if you're doing the quality control today, and you use an abdominal probe, and then you come back six months later and you use a vascular probe, your results are going to be dramatically different. So you want to use the same probe. Um, what I always do is I always use the same probe, again, you get rid of all software corrections, um, and then I always use the lowest frequency that that probe will perform. And that way you know, if you do that, you're consistent every single time. So, okay, I use the abdominal probe, I use the lowest frequency. So when you come back six months later, you're going to be able to replicate those results. Then we have image uniformity. So ACR asks, is the image uniform uh, from left to right? And that's where we go back to the drop -offs. So you can say, I, I agree that the image is uniform, I slightly disagree, or I strongly disagree. And so if you say you slightly disagree that the image is uniform, or you strongly disagree that the image is uniform, you are now out of compliance. You have got that system. And that's when you have to document some profile identifiers to fix it. Back and This is the mechanical check, and it shows your camera running the fast machine. And they asked about the casters. Um, at one time, the old Acusan Sequoias, they had a problem with the weldment, where uh, when people did portables, the weldment would snap in the system and tear. Um, so I think that's why they put that in. Um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the survey, they say it is correct, correct, is corrective action required, yes or no. So if any of those things that you marked requires a corrective action, you have to say yes, corrective action is required. And again, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with balances as long as you show you fix it. Uh, acceptance testing. You have a machine that so the department hasn't been used. It's been in a storage closet for a year or two. We're down in the shop. And some other department says, hey, I need the machine. You don't want to walk by it. And I'm saying, well, we got one in the closet. We got one in the phone here. We can pull it out. <clears throat> this is optional. <clears throat> but on um, ACR, they recommend that you perform this check when either new equipment comes in or you're bringing old equipment back from service. I don't think you necessarily have to do on new equipment again. Systems today are thorough. Uh, 
Um, I, I have my favorite manufacturers, um, but mainly I like different manufacturers because of serviceability and things like that. But as far as image quality, you looked at GE Phillips, Siemens, uh, Toshiba, you know, all, all, even Sonosites, you know, all the major players that are out there, um, all their, their high-end machines, they're all gorgeous. Um, the the images are stuck today's, today's machines. So when they come in, and typically, uh, biomed folks have to do electrical safety and so on, you know, the machine. So I, you know, since this is optional, I wouldn't go through all this. Uh, I think it'd be a waste of time because it's just the real one. And because they're all software driven, if they're broken, you're not going to be able to do anything. So you're going to know if, it's, if something's broken. Things, things don't want to adjust. Things are fine here too. Pulling out of storage, the accept assessing. It, it's, it's a good idea if you're pulling something out of storage because why do they go into storage in the first place? You know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> So, ACR says you should have a quality control program. It states their option. <clears throat> ACR states their quality control program is optional. And then right after they say, a continuous QC program is essential. So if it's essential, why is it optional? Um, and I've actually, I've talked to people over there and uh, I, spent, I spent days working my way through ACR. Nobody can answer that question. Um, I can never, I can never find a person who wrote this, who wrote this document. I don't think they're there anymore. Uh, but since I teach this stuff, well, I need an answer. If you say it's essential, why is it optional? So do I tell people they have to do it? Because essential means you have to do it, right? You need to do this. Um, but so you should have. They say you should have a continuous QC program. So the physical mechanical inspection is part of that. Uh, image uniformity. The geometric accuracy is part of the QC program, so they want you to measure. Um, and then the display performances. And the minimum, they're saying the minimum frequency of QC tests is semi-annual, so twice a year. So they're saying you have to do it twice a year at a minimum. But they also say that's essential and you have an option. So I don't know But I've never seen anybody fail because of that. Um, is there also, um, they state that regular preventive maintenance should be performed and documented by a qualified service person. Um, the OEM recommendations, they do vary. Um, how many people have GE scanners here? Which, which ones do you have? Do you, do you still have the L9s? Oh. As a workforce, I wrote the service manual for that. So the um, the Logic Nine, um, the I believe the service manual for the Logic Nine, the one I wrote, I didn't write it for GE. I wrote a, a third party service manual for that. Um, but I recommended that you do two PMs per year. I think the OEM service manual recommended that as well. The the most recent, the the flagship for GE today is the Logic E Nine. If you read the service manual for the Logic E9, General Electric states, and this is almost verbatim, um, that since there are no moving parts within the system, um, preventative maintenance is not required. I think that's probably one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Uh, you have to do PMs on, on a machine. Um, yeah, how, how do you find things that are efficient? Yeah. Even down to cleaning the filters uh, with, with these newer machines and the, and the power supplies and things like that. GE and their infinite wisdom, and I, I love general electric machines, don't get me wrong, but um, the, the E9 is about this far from the floor, and the air filters are underneath the machine. So it's a giant vacuum cleaner, and it just sucks everything up under that filter. And, and then there's a, there's a power supply tray right up above that, and there's a mesh filter on that that clogs up. And then, and then the power supply starts smoking. And so if you're not doing the ground maintenance, if you're not cleaning those filters, the sonographers are not cleaning filters, contrary to what people say they do, nobody does. Um, you are going to smoke those power supplies and you know, you got to check probes. Um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, it's not part of this, but um, as a service person, um, doing system backups. Um, you got to back up these systems on a regular basis. Because if the power or if the, if the hard drive dies, which it will, um, I can guarantee it, especially if you're going to report this, um, you're going to lose all your presets. So even if you reload all your software, if you don't have the presets that are on the machine, you know, 
all the, uh, the imaging presets, the diagram destinations, the, the options, and so on. Um, that machine is useless unless you have a solid map. So I, I think it's foolish to say you don't need to do PMs. I, in, in my mind, you need to do two of So that's it for ACR. Any questions on ACR? So AIUM. Um, AUM is uh, another large accreditation body. It's the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. So they have um, their quality assurance program. They're actually a lot looser than ACR. ACR is loose. These guys are really looser. So um, similar to ACR, um, there's three legs to this. Uh, the first two legs are the sonographer requiring images and the physician's interpretation of those images. So we have nothing to do with that. That's, that's their responsibility. Our job is the um, quality control. So they ask you to do a visual inspection of the probe daily. So the sonographers are supposed to be doing this, which they don't. But they want you to check the lens, the housing, strain relief, cable, connector, and pin back. I think it's a great idea. I wish people did. Um, but if we go to the, the housing, um, how many of you folks have uh, ever uh, gotten a report of a shock? Anybody ever heard of anybody get shot? Did, were you able to validate it? Uh, like I said, I've done this for 33 years, and uh, I've probably investigated three or four dozen uh, reports of, uh, of a shock. And of course, you know, we hear that, patient safety, shut it down, you know, we got to take it very, very seriously. Um, when I've gone out, virtually every single time, there's a micro crack in the corner uh, where the lens goes into the housing of a transducer. And these micro cracks, when you magnify them, they're kind of jagged and they're V-shaped. And what happens is, as the sonographer is sweeping the transducer across the patient, that little crack grabs a hair. And we're, we're not part of the body. I mean, we're, you know, even if you don't see hair, we have hair all over our bodies. We're monkeys. Um, we have hair everywhere. And when that transducer grabs that hair and fucks it, if you think about it, if I fuck the hair out of my arm, it's going to feel like a shock. Right? And it's that, that, that quick, sharp pain. And so when we look for these, these cracks, um, those cracks, can be the cause of the shock, uh, the shock. But I have, I have never been able to legitimize a shock uh, report. In fact, Ted and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, Ted hasn't been able to uh, find any either. So between the two of us, we've, we've figured hundreds of thousands of probes, and uh, we've, we've never been able to validate a shock. I thought we wouldn't take it seriously. It just hasn't happened yet. So, um, like ACR, um, AOM says element or channel failure. Do you have any drop box? Um, this is our examples again. This is a minor. We have a single element out here. Uh, we have multiple elements out here, and, um, and they're adjacent to each other. And then in this particular image, we have multiple elements out spread out throughout the transducer. So AIUM wrote these standards. Uh, there is actually a manual, you see AI, AIUM quality control manual. Uh, I have a copy on my desk at home and I've read it. Um, in fact, I've, I've spoken to the author. Uh, the author is a, a guy by the name of Nick Hodgebro. He's a, he's a physicist at the manual. And he wrote the manual and I sat down with him for a moment. Uh, and we talked about this. And uh, he's, they utilize us for a quarter group. And I said, well, you know, what, he said, what, is your, what are your standards? I said, our standards, it's got to be perfect. Um, if we will not set, send out a probe with a single element. So when we deliver a probe, it's perfect. Um, but our standards aren't that tight when we evaluate probes, because if we evaluate probes with that standard, I'd probably fill half the probes as it's possible. <clears throat> and even the OEMs, um, I have uh, patent applications on my computer at home. Um, uh, from Philips and from uh, General Electric, it's patents for technology that will cover up dead elements on brand new manufactured transducers. And so even the OEMs, they manufacture transducers with dead elements. And they have technology that buries that element or uses adjacent elements to kind of, kind of compensate for that dead element. Uh, but we won't do that. Um, every probe we send out has, it's got 128 elements, every one's um, So I, I talked to this, this guy, Nick, at the Mayo, and I said, well, here's our standards. And he said, well, you know, my standards are a little looser. And I said, but no, you wrote this. I said, well, that was before I was paying for this. 
If you're not going to pay them for it, our standards just got a little bit looser. So, what the manual says is there's four different angles. So, a perfect probe is number one. Number one is I got a beautiful probe. Every cable, every uh, coaxial cable for the main harness is, is perfect. Every element is firing the way it's supposed to. Pristine probe. That's what we want. And number two is one or two minor flaws present. So if we go back to here, this would be a number two. That's a minor flaw. So the impact, it's considered operational and can be used for scanning. Or the AIUM. <clears throat> so what they say, the action is, is inspect occasionally to see if it gets worse. And I would agree with that. Um, you know, like I said, Ted and I go out, we, we do these inspections in hospitals all the time. And I can't. If I nitpicked um, every single probe, um, during, during my years as a service engineer, um, when I look at probes, Ted, if we go to a hospital, if, let's use, we'll use probe, our friends at Pro Health as an example. Um, if you went through their hospital, what percentage of probes would you find some defect? 25 to 30 percent. And that's, that's for nitpicking, uh, which we do not do. And so, so you're, you're saying 25 to 40 would be a number two, I, I was going to say 30%, so we're on the same page. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> a number three is three or more minor flaws are present. Um, now they're saying this is borderline. Uh, replace as soon as convenient. Um, a number three is this. I would not want that probe used on me or me. Maybe a competitor, not a <clears throat> So as, as soon as convenient, I'd get it out. Um, you know, if, if they need to use it that day, you know, call one of us, we'll send you a loan or overnight, or we'll send you a replacement, whatever. Um, but I'd get it out of there as quickly as possible. Um, that as soon as convenient, I, during my years as a service engineer, I, I came across probes that sonographers were using. I'm like, what the hell are you still using this? Half the image would be gone. Oh, I just kind of working around it. Fix the image. Um, I, I, I've seen some real horror stories. Number four, major flaws are present. Unacceptable for clinical use, get it out of there immediately. Stop using the probe. Remove from service. This would be a major flaw because it's multiple elements out and it's in the, the main field of view. When we look at, when we evaluate a transducer array, uh, we go, the main field of view is the middle 60%, and we have 20%, 20%. If there's a defect that's off, in the 20% area, sonographers will work around that. Um, but if you have a shadow like this in the middle of the image, you can see how this, this dropout how it permeates throughout the image. That's, that's casting a shadow. The thing about ultrasound, one of the things that I can do a cool while, I love ultrasound. The cool thing is, is that the position only sees what the sonographer chooses to show. And I'm, I'm not going to denigrate other modalities when I say this, and so I'm going to put a little asterisk there, but if you look at the x ray, Actually, I'm going to do a chest x-ray. Here we go. I'm standing here. I get flashed. The radiologist sees the entire image. MRI. You lay on the table. The, the radiologist sees the entire thing. CT, same thing. Mammal, same thing. With ultrasound, the sonographer has to work through all these various acoustic windows and pull out the images that they believe the radiologist will want to see. If the sonographer doesn't find those, the radiologist doesn't see it. That's why ultrasound sonographers are the second highest paid Second highest paid technologist in the imaging space. Um, PET CT people make um, a little bit more than, than ultrasound folks. Uh, but ultrasound folks are very highly paid. Thank God, because I'm very good. Um, and I make 12 bucks an hour or so. <clears throat> so, with this, this major flaw here, if we have a major flaw in the middle, the radiologist is going to see a shadow on that image. But what's the shadow? Is it, is it technology? Or do I have a bad probe? So something like this, you want to get out of there quickly. Get out of there immediately. So AIUM recommends the highest frequency possible when you're scanning the machine. So when we're talking about ACR, I always use the lowest frequency, check penetration. AIUM suggests the highest possible frequency. Um, we're talking a shallow field of view. Again, a single focal point. We don't want to use multiple focal points. Does everybody know what a focal point is? What, what, what it does? What the machine's doing? Um, what happens is we, we talked about the transducer lens and how the lens is designed to mechanically focus the ultrasound beam. 
That's a mechanical focus. That's how the, the lens and the transistor is constructed. With, um, with the focal points is we can actually, with the use of uh, delay technology, delay circuits within the machine, we can create an electronic focus as well. So we can tell the machine, I'm going to focus here, or I'm going to focus here. And by moving that focal point, you can change where the machine is going to be focused. And with multiple focal points, you can tell the machine, I want to focus here, 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 here. And so you want to go down to a single zone. And again, you turn off all the software corrections, just like ACR. So maximum depth of penetration. So you must use the same model phantom. So we want to be consistent. Um, do all your folks have phantoms in here? What kind of phantoms do you have? Which one? The gamuts. Yeah. So you have to have recharge over here. Okay. It's, they're, they're great phantoms, but they're, they're temperamental. I used to carry one. I, I, I did service in Arizona for the longest time. I used to carry one. You can't leave those in the trunk of a car. Yeah, I, I always like the uh, the ATS. It looks like a block of ballistic gel. Uh, they're solid, they're bulletproof, and you can throw them down a flight of stairs. And, uh, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> so you always must use the same panel. That's the other thing I like about the uh, the ATS fans. I, I have no stake in the, in the company, but I just like the fans. Um, you never have to calibrate them. You never have to do anything. They're always consistent with the Gamex fans. Over time, the, the top um, the, the scanning service will start to uh, uh, lower a little bit. Now, if that, if, if that deflates or if it starts to sink in a little bit, that's going to affect your measurements. And so I, I never yeah, I never liked those fans. I never always So you always want to use the same one. Use the same preset. Again, um, we talked about presets. Use the same imaging presets. Otherwise, you're going to get inconsistent results. And then the best practice is photo document the system settings. So before we had you know, these, these cell phones with, with cameras, um, all these systems used to have you know, either a camera on them or a black and white printer or something like that. Um, I used to always save, uh, snap pictures and leave them on the system. So find some way to document what preset you're using. Especially if you have multiple service personnel. Uh, I'm gonna go in and do, I'm gonna do the inspection today and then Ted's gonna come in in six months. Well, that doesn't work. Um, so by documenting that, we're gonna get consistent. So uh, frequency, they say, um, they, here's where uh, AOM gets a little consistent. In one, in one section, they say, choose the highest frequency of the probe. And here, they're saying close to the center frequency of the transistor. So which is, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, what's important for you folks is pick one. Um, I would go with the first statement, the highest, because what's the center frequency of the transistor? You'd have to go through all the different frequencies you can do and then figure out the middle. And you know, now you're doing math. Um, so just choose the highest one, just you crank it up to the frequency of the probe so you can try it. Um, single focal point and an acoustic output, maximum or 100%. Every machine today, almost, um, has the ability to adjust the acoustic output, how much energy you're trying to How are you doing the time? I got five minutes left? Wow, okay, I got to speed up. Um, so you want your uh, your output at maximum. So maximum depth of penetration, just like HDR. We're so saying if you have a five percent decrease in maximum depth of penetration, it's a cause for concern. I don't know that you're going to be able to see five percent because it's subjective. We're looking at the noise floor again, just like we did with ACR. I don't think I'm going to be able to tell five percent. Um, Ten percent probably. Um, AIUM mandates that you check the um, lateral and extra resolution. So they do want you to measure the pins. So measure our vertical pins here and our horizontal pins, so our axial and our lateral resolution. Um, presets, we talked about that. Speed up just a little bit. They ask you to look at the assists, which are the rock targets. And the grayscale targets. Can you see all the different grayscale targets? So AIUM is saying the contrast resolution is there. And there's our one, two, three, four. You can see that here. And this is the form that we created uh, for AIUM that kind of encompasses all those things. 
Um, they don't offer a standardized form for assessing each one. And so we can send you this one. So let's jump into IAC. IAC is super loose. They say, hey, you should look at the machine once in a while. Um, one of the important things about IAC, though, and this is, this is critical for a variety of reasons, um, is that IAC requires, mandates, that electrical safety test, testing is performed on a TD probes in between each and every patient. And that's huge um, for, for two reasons. One is obviously the concern about patient safety, patient safety first. The second reason is where we kind of come in, um, where we have some control. If you do an electrical safety test on a TE probe and you fail, that means there's a breach somewhere in that probe. Um, those probes get submerged in liquid for testing and for disinfection. Liquid gets inside those probes and it starts heating. So if you fail an electrical safety test, Get it on it and ensure, and this is part of what uh, Ted and I do when we do these inspections, these, these process analyses, is we look at the whole life cycle of probe in the hospital. But one of the things we both focus on is when and where is the electrical safety test performed? Do they perform it after the entire probe is processed and right before they do a patient? Or do they perform it before the probe is processed? You want to do it before. Because if, if, the, if you have a failure, the probe is not going to process it, hasn't been disinfected, it hasn't been submerged or subjected to high pressure washes, it's going to get fluid inside of it. So if you fail right after the probe is used, before you process it, if you fail at that point, you're probably still in good shape. Uh, the difference in cost between replacing a bending rubber and a insertion tube like a probe and a full blown rebuild because fluid got inside a probe is exponential. Bending rubber and insertion tube, the bending rubber is. 1500 bucks, 1000 bucks, you know, somewhere in there, um, relatively cheap. Um, an insertion tube, you're, you know, we're moving up in cost, and we're looking at you know, four or five thousand on a, a 3D, 4D TE. Um, full blown fluid, fluid invasion could be 10, 15,000, or it could be total. Um, if, if you get fluid invasion, what happens is when these probes get fluid invaded and that people energize those probes, it blows up the array. And we can't fix the array, nor can the OEM or anybody else. Once, the, once those arrays go into the INTE probes, we, uh, we, we can replace the array, but we can't fix it. And so, um, in your processes, when you all go back home, take a look at your TE curve um, and see where the electrical safety testing is taking place. And if it's taking place after processing, move it, move that process to be cool. And I guarantee you, you will cut down on your TE expenses. So that's, that's the big thing with IAC. Other than that, they say, hey, can't clean the machine once all taking the time. They're, they're extraordinarily loose. So um, IAC does apply to uh, cardiac and vascular. They say the, mach the machine must be maintained in a good operating condition, routine inspection. What does routine mean? It, they don't define uh, the term. Um, they say you have to have a policy for cleaning the machine and probes and so on. So we talked about the leakage testing. Again, that, that's, that's huge. If you take nothing else away from today, um, this, the leakage testing. Find out where you're doing it, when you're doing it, and if you're doing it at an appropriate place, an interval, the TE uses, move that, move that process to the And then we go into best practices. Uh, we talk about uh, lenses. Um, we do have a care sheet. If you, um, again, if you stop by booth 203, uh, we have some posters in there that talk about what care and so on. We kind of rule through this. Um, and again, I can, oh, one other thing uh, before you folks go um, best practices. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into an old center room where people leave gel on the face of Tennessee. Um, gel has been B and B, you know, validated, verified to be safe for ultrasound probes if it's used properly. Um, the biggest killer of ultrasound probes. Uh, besides impacts, besides physical damage, is kind of, um, either people use the wrong chemicals or they use the right chemicals, but they use them incorrectly. And so gel is great, but if you leave it on a probe for 24 hours, you're going to damage the nuts. Um, isopropyl alcohol is great on a TE probe. If you're cleaning a stainless steel house, if you're cleaning the insertion tube, it's not so great. It's going to damage the tube. Um, so what we recommend with chemicals is always look at the OEM manuals. Uh, 
I, I'd love to tell you there's one chemical that is perfect for every transducer to make a large object. There's not. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not very good at killing bugs, especially in today's environment. Um, yeah, even even up to I mean the, the, the greatest thing out there for under cavity probes is trophy. Um, I love trophy. Um, it, it kills bugs. The problem is it kills probes too. Uh, we went through a year, year and a half of uh, validation with Nanosonics, the manufacturer of Trophon, to validate our process. We make, you know, we, we uh, manufacture hammer molds and things like that. The cork comes in, the, the mold is broken, the, the case is broken. We make another case, which is just like the OEM. We use the OEM probe to create our molds. Uh, we use, you know, we have different formulations of plastics where we have to validate all the plastics with whatever the manufacturer recommends as a painter of this effect. Uh, Trophon was a doozy. It, it took us a while to get that plastic right. Even the OEM probes getting into our uh, arsenal. So we've, we've, uh, we've figured out the formula. Um, and then uh, endocavity and T probes. See these, these guys here, the, the green and yellow? Those are tip protectors. Um, a tip protector should be on your T probes anytime the probe is not being disinfected or inside the patient. That's the rule of thumb. Um, so if, if, if the probe is not on a patient or being disinfected, have a tip protector on or a couple of bucks. And those, those tips, uh, if you, again, if you stop by uh, 203, we have an array in our booth from, we have two arrays. One is one we manufacture in Denver. Um, the other one is an X7-2T array. Um, and you can see how small it is. And we magnify it 250 times and you can see all the different elements. Um, those things are extraordinarily fragile. If, if I took an X7-2T, this was the array, and I did that, that array is dead. That's, that's all it takes. And so these tip protectors are crucial. We're in the program care business, we might protect our people break probes, um, but we try and help people. And this is the, one of the number one things you can do is use it. And that's it, I'm exhausted. Any questions? <laughs>